Welcome back, everybody. Um, I believe this will be the, the third season, or so to speak, of the Diatom Web Academy after a, maybe the, the summer sampling break for everybody as we go into the fall. Um, a lot of folks here, or a few folks here, had uh, just uh, come back from the, the 26th um, North American Diatom Symposium. It's a symposium about diatoms. It's now been running, we've determined, for 52 years. So that's uh, got some nice legs under it. Um, I sadly didn't get to join, um, but you can, uh, I think, probably still catch up on some of the talks um, that were recorded. Um, you might be able to do some post-registration. It'd be interesting to talk to Jeffrey about that. Um, I don't have any significant diatom news. I've read some cool papers recently, and maybe we can talk about those in the future. Um, our uh, upcoming talk in two weeks will be by Blanca on the diatom flora, establishing the diatom flora of the South Platte River. And today's talk will be uh, given by uh, Dr. Mark Evelyn. Um, it's a project that I have uh, all collaborated with him on. And Mark will be talking today about uh, occurrences of Denimos and um, uh, North and Minnesota's North Shore rivers and, uh, and along the lake shore of Lake Superior. And uh, without further ado, Mark, take it away. All right. Thank you, David. Give me a thumbs up. You can hear me okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to see, see us all back together for another, um, another season of, of Diatom Web Academy. Um, I'll, I'll kick off the, the season with a, an update on what we're doing up in Minnesota. Um, we're looking at how Didymo has suddenly appeared in Minnesota's North Shore streams. And I know in a few other Great Lakes locations, it's similarly um, jumped into some of the rivers, whereas before it was sort of a, a well-behaved, friendly soul who uh, liked to live on, in Lake Superior. Um, let me get... Hold on here. I got to get my stuff advancing properly. <clears throat> there we go. All right. Um, the group that we've got working together on, on Didymo on the North Shore is, is wide and varied. Um, at our institution, uh, we've got David, myself, Adam Heathcote, um, and Joe Mohan. Mohan was hired uh, earlier this spring as a, as a postdoc working on that project. We also got the education group at the Science Museum of Minnesota with uh, Farzad heading that up to help us program Didymo. Uh, at the University of Minnesota Duluth, Cody Sheik and uh, his brand new graduate student who started about, what month is it? About 27 days ago, um, it, are, are, also, are also working on the Didymo problems. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that we, we do want to have is agency representation. So the Minnesota DNR Fisheries is also um, helping out on this. They're helping out with some of the, the lake sampling as well as our stream sampling. That's primarily headed up by Heidi uh, Rantala and um, Cor Corey Goldsworthy, uh, as well as a bunch of other folks that we'll talk about who have uh, helped out. Bob Pillsbury at UW Oshkosh is running our 16S genetics on the, on the, the, the DNA or the uh, Didymo maps that we're collecting. And he's also been involved in other, other uh, Didymo projects in the Great Lakes Basin. So what's today's plan? I want to talk just a little bit about first the history of the problem and what our research strategy in approaching Didymo in the Great Lakes and, near, and North Shore is. We'll talk about what we learned in our first uh, rapid fire um, sampling events that we did in 2021, talk a little bit about what we're seeing this year in terms of whether it's the same or different than last year. And then I'll finish up talking a bit about outreach and education opportunities that we're leveraging to try to, you know, put the news about Didymo on the, on the street and, uh, and, and help everyone understand uh, issues around the Great Lakes, the North Shore, and the risks that we face from aquatic uh, invasive species. Then we can finish up with some, some Q&A at the end of the talk. So what do we know about Didymo or Roxnot as the media has dubbed it? Um, we all know Didymo is a diatom, of course, and it's a big diatom. It typically is it, it's right around 100 microns or 0.1 millimeters. It's you know still microscopic to the naked eye, but uh, when you get it under the microscope, it's the one that really jumps out to you. It's got a great shape, um, and it's huge compared to uh, you know the vast majority of diatoms that we that we uh, think about. In terms of its uh, sort of 
normal ecology and distribution, we think of it as a cold water form that lives in low nutrients or base flow conditions in streams and in some large lakes around the world. Um, however, it is um, also a diatom that um, seems like it's, it's getting a bad rap right now because it's beginning to appear in the US and world where it's forming uh, thick mats. And this is, can be all across uh, you know, the eastern, eastern seabird, Vermont, New York, Pennsylvania, into the Appalachian streams, uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, even the Great Plains where we start seeing it in Oklahoma, uh, South Dakota, and then in our western, our western parts of North America as well with Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, um, where oftentimes it's found in cold streams, but it's also um, problematic because it's quite often found in uh, tail race, um, uh, impacting tail race fisheries um, where uh, hypolimnetic waters are drained through um, uh, large dams and create cold water conditions that seem to be perfect for didymo. Other places, of course, that it's gotten all over include the, the real, um, you know, the, sort of the poster child for this, which is uh, New Zealand, where it appears to have been introduced and really impacted a lot of uh, things there. Um, the issues seem to be centered around two things, whether it's a, uh, you know, there's a, a genotype that is getting out there and aggressively colonizing, or if our environments, global environments are changing to a, a point where Didymo can suddenly uh, survive and thrive in places that it, it, it wasn't able to before. Where Didymo does get um, in, become a problem, it, it, it's described as having the triple threat. It affects the ecology, recreational opportunities, and economy of these areas. In terms of the eco eco ecology, we know that it affects you know, everything from bacterial communities, algal communities, invertebrate communities, and fish communities as to how it, it can change that uh, before and after didymo things. From recreational opportunities, it's a, it just it looks nasty in a stream, um, especially for anglers um, who, as, and especially for fl fly anglers who want to you know, make those beautiful casts and catch those beautiful trout. Um, it's no fun when every cast you get comes back with a gob of goo on the end of your uh, end of your dry fly or your nymph. And in terms of the economy, um, in places like New Zealand, we know that there's been you know a multi-million twenty estimates are estimated at twenty million dollar hit to the economy in um, New Zealand because of the invasion of Didymo, and in Minnesota's North Shore, there's about a two hundred and 50 million dollar North Shore summer economy that we we don't want to put at risk. <clears throat> so what do we know about Lake Superior Didymo? Um, as with many things in the Great Lakes and diatom community, we all have to go back to Gene Stormer. That's a picture of Gene Stormer and Bobby uh, the day they got married in 1961. On that uh, after their wedding in Iowa, they headed up to uh, do the Great Circle tour of of uh, Lake Superior and stopped in August of 1961 at Grand Marais, Minnesota. And of course, as a good diatomist, you, even on your honeymoon, you collect diatoms and Stormer uh, collected uh, from the Grand Marais Harbor um, a sample in 1961. We also know uh, that it, Didymo was reported in Lake Michigan in the 1800s from a couple of early reports as well. Um, Stormer didn't publish on it right away in 1961, but his samples were used in a couple of later publications in the 80s that uh, you know, documented images of those samples that were, were collected during his, during his honeymoon. Um, after it was discovered and or found for the, for the first time in 1961, I should say that we have, you have no reason to believe it wasn't there before 1961. It's just that no one was looking for it. But there was a great, uh, a long series of paraphyton studies uh, through the late 60s, early 70s that reported Didymo from um, uh, Lake Superior um, as part of the paraphyton community. Uh, and these were, these were typically uh, studies that were done looking at what would happen if we started enriching Lake Superior and what, what impacts that would have. The picture on the right there is the beautiful uh, 3D rendering of uh, of uh, Didymosphenia was done by Mary Moffat, who was a student up at Michigan Tech University in, in, the, in the 1990s. 
um, it created this very, very you know, gorgeous uh, 3D rendering of, uh, of what uh, Didymo looks like inside based on both uh, SEM and TEM studies. <clears throat> but as all things sometimes happen, they go, they go bad. And uh, in the late 2000s and into the 2010s, we started noting increased uh, abundance of, of, of uh, Didymo in, in our Lake Superior samples, especially in our nearshore samples. There was a white paper that was put out by Thompson and Jensen sort of describing the, the issue and the problem and extent of it based on a couple of years of things. And a number of us sort of began opportunistic survey efforts um, looking for Didymo, trying to keep track of when it was doing, when it was, you know, growing in great abundance, when it wasn't, where it was, things like that. And, and the press, of course, picked up on it too, uh, back back in the back in the day, including uh, with that classic, that classic uh, headline there. That's not toilet paper; it's rock snot. <clears throat> um, Bob and I and, and some students uh, did some initial work on just on the Lake Superior stuff, trying to understand and ask this answer this question of whether these older collections, which um, you know had we had access to from the early '80s up through the mid mid 2010s, uh, whether they were suggesting anything was changing in Lake Superior. And what we we found based on on shape analysis is that there was really not a lot of variability um, in the in the in the Didymosphenia collections over those 30 year periods in terms of their morphology, you know, suggesting that maybe what this was pointing at was in Lake Superior was a changing environment hypothesis that just localized populations given the right conditions were growing in a new kind of a new level of abundance that we didn't see a, you know, a new shape or a shape group that, that uh, had shown up in Lake Superior. But then things changed. In 2018, um, the Poplar River, which is about midway along the, the north shore of Lake Superior in Minnesota, um, came up with just a, we, we had a, a, a colleague at, the, at, the, at the, the Lutzen Resort area who noted in the stream this large amount of rock snot that was there and got samples to the right people and really picked up on it. Um, it got lots of lots of press initially when it when it came out. Um, it was something that was you know really new and had never been seen in our North Shore streams before, only in Lake Superior. Um, when we took a look at those samples under the microscopes, it was there was very very much abundant uh, Didymo mats. We appeared to have gotten there a little bit late. There was a lot of empty stocks and. Um, and the, the mats themselves were fairly full of sediment and things. But it was one thing we could see is that it was clearly not Lake Superior mats. These were not periphyton mats from Lake Superior that someone had you know, carried upstream and thrown in the river or something like that. There was just, it was a very different periphyton community that included Didymo that was on these Poplar River mats. <clears throat> um, so what this what this ended up doing was really spurring our efforts on this Lake Superior. This invasion of the river said we've got we've got a problem. We need to really put some efforts in it. So as a as a group, we re reached out to multiple funding sources. Um, one is called the ENT, ENRTF, the Environmental Natural Resources Fund, or it's also called LCCMR in Minnesota. We also reached out to the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Coastal Program, and also to Minnesota Sea Grant to um, get a, uh, try to secure funding to put, put together a focused effort on these projects. And we've, we've been able to do that with them. Three of our, uh, three, three projects, four, four projects now having been funded to, to work on this Didymo effort. And what I wanna do <clears throat> is sort of talk about how we're approaching this Didymo problem in the streams and in Lake Superior. So what we're going to be doing is first determining the source of Didymo in our North Shore streams and Lake Superior. This is gonna be done with molecular analysis and comparison between um, Lake Superior and the rivers, as well as against uh, North American populations. The second thing we're gonna be doing is try to understand sort of the distribution dynamics and effect of Didymo by monitoring. Now, this is gonna be done by some intensive monitoring of five streams and uh, the lake sites that are nearby the, the river mouths themselves. And we're hitting those with all kinds of water quality, algae, 
diatoms, uh, 16S, and ecological conditions of these, of these systems. Third, we're doing, um, in each year, we're going to do a full survey of all the streams. There's about, there's about 25 streams up and down the, the uh, north shore of Minnesota there. And so in, in one month, we're trying to do a full survey uh, in the years 21 uh, through 23. And hopefully in the future, if we can continue to get a little, uh, a couple more years of funding in place for that. And those will add to our, our thing to, to really give us a better sense of which North Shore streams may be at risk by hitting those with some, uh, um, hitting those with some, some sampling uh, uh, at, at, one, at one time of the year. Finally, um, we want, we pulled in our DNR colleagues to really get a better understanding of the distribution dynamics and effect of Didymo in Lake Superior itself. And for two summers, last summer and this summer, we've been monitoring uh, depth transects in the lake, moving from uh, near shore, half a meter depth where we can wade all the way out to 16 meters or about 50 foot depth in, in these Lake Superior transects. These are also um, sites where they're, they're going out to known um, spawning reefs for uh, very important species uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes, both for sports angling and for commercial that include lake trout, um, uh, the various ciscos, including lake whitefish and lake herring and round whitefish, as well as a threatened species in, in the Great Lakes that's called the coaster brook trout that also utilize these aspects. Here we're we're going to be looking at uh, gill netting uh, at these sites, as well as the paraphyton collection, and looking at uh, how utilization of fish spawning is happening on these sites in relation to uh, paraphyton development. So what, what do we do? In 2021, we headed out and hit our five streams. At each of these streams, our strategy is to look at physical characteristics. So we've got flow, we measure flow, pH, temperature, DO, turbidity, conductivity, um, using a, a standard um, uh, YSI. And then from our, our, uh, our sampling, we do, um, uh, we look at the whole suite of water quality, both totals and dissolves, and then sample the paraphyton. The paraphyton is getting sampled for ash-free dry mass, benthic chlorophyll, uh, diatom communities, of course, as well as uh, preserving samples for molecular analysis. These five stream sites are also outfitted with um, uh, loggers that are deployed, uh, uh, taking temperature and, and discharge. So we got pressure and temperature loggers in the streams that are, are we can look at, uh, at flow conditions in these streams as well over time. Our sampling for uh, paraphyte is using a, a, a modified design of a, of a lobe, the lobe sampler that uh, our folks at the DNR put together. Um, what we needed to do in this situation is actually have a, a lobe sampler that could be used for um, by divers underwater <laughs> and who are all gloved up in dry suits and things. So it's got kind of big handles and it's a little a little more industrial than some of the other uh, lobe samplers that I think we've we've all worked with. <clears throat> uh, we hit the blitz streams, the 20 streams, again, measuring all of these for the same characteristics of, of uh, thing of, of that we measured it, we're monitoring in our other five streams. And here, uh, the only thing we're doing, of course, is getting our flow measurements uh, only one time with our single visit, but hoping to understand what the risk of these streams to Didymo invasion would be. And finally, out in Lake Superior, um, again, this is, had never been done before. Um, we identified five fisheries transects, and we've, we've actually dropped one just simply because of as cold as the water is, it's difficult for the divers to put together uh, too many dives in a single day. But we've located good reef habitat. We're doing spent their, uh, water column profiles, as well as sampling water quality, and then the same types of uh, analyses on the paraphyton themselves. We're using the RV Blackfin at the DNR fisheries vessel. Very, Great, uh, great dive platform and a great dive team, and also looking at egg collection along those transects as well during this uh, latter part of the year during the spawning season. So what did we learn? What did we learn? Um, in 2021, we got a big shock, um, whereas we had kind of hit this 
hit this or attack this project thinking the Poplar River was their, our issue stream and we had some hypothesis as why that might have Didymo in it. Uh, it turned out that by the end of the season, we had found Didymo in seven streams in uh, on the North Shore of Lake Superior. And one of those streams was not the Poplar, that it, it actually didn't show up with, uh, with Didymo in 2021. The densities that we saw of Didymo range from you know, less than 1,000 to over 100,000 cells per centimeter squared. So we were seeing abundances of Didymo or bloom conditions that are, that are quite typical of some of the other worldwide outbreaks that we're seeing. Um, we did find Didymo in those nearshore sites, those half meter deep sites in Lake Superior, fairly common, but not in nearly the abundance that we found in the streams. So it was at lower abundances in those nearshore sites in, in Lake Superior. Um, here's some pictures of what it looked like. Um, on the right is a picture of not Didymo. On the, on the, the three on the left are uh, what Didymo populations. In the Caribou River, we began to see sort of early development yeah, these little tufts of, of paraphyton, um, where we saw it in massive amounts was in places like the Devil Track River, where there's a, a, an above a, a rock that's been come out of the water and then underwater pictures as well, where I would say we were typically seeing two to three centimeter growths of paraphyton, of didymo on these, um, on these, uh, on these habitats in our North Shore streams. Um, so what do we know about 2021 and, and 2018? We saw it is that, and in 2022, is that we have we hit three very very dry years, um, where for a great part of the summer all of these streams were uh, went through a, a very rapid spring freshet of, uh, of meltwater, and then they reached they went down to base flow for most of the summer. So we were seeing you know, streams that were primarily being fed by uh, low nutrient groundwater. So we know that water quality, uh, uh, we had very low nutrients during this time. Our water quality samples are still being analyzed. We just got a new instrument at the station. So we're given that a, a test, a run uh, to, to fill in all our, all our data sites. But um, the, the, right now, the 2018, 2021, and 2022 all seem to be very, very dry summers where, where streams were at at base flow and didn't have any sort of, you know, multiple flashiness in the summer that we, we might typically think of as, you know, summer storms move through. <clears throat> um, the molecular work that Bob Pillsbury is doing is undergoing, uh, is, is underway right now for our, our, our 2021 samples. We'll be adding the 2022 samples in. I know the image there on the right is some work that Bob has done on uh, St. Uh, diatoms from the St. Mary's River, which is in the UP of Michigan, where Didymo has also become a problem child, um, that really identifies that bacterial communities differ between a Didymo map and a non-Didymo uh, paraphyte map. Finally, David is uh, <clears throat> and Cody Sheik are heading up the molecular analyses of the streams. Uh, we started out by doing some long read DNA, DNA sequencing using 50 individual cell isolations from uh, of Didymo from both the lake and one of the river samples uh, so that we can de develop a reference genome with which to compare other populations of those samples. Um, that's one thing, one place where we could use help. Uh, we want to be able to compare um, these Minnesota populations, both our rivers and our streams, to other North American populations. Um, I want to note right now that just in the last year, less than a year, two rivers in Michigan have also shown up with um, Didymo uh, that has, um, whatever, uncharacteristically been identified in them, the Boardman River and the Manistee River. Um, and we're looking to if, and I know David may have already reached out to many of you, but if you have access to Didymo, uh, we'd be happy to send you a small sampling kit where we'd like to get um, uh, populations of Didymo from around North America. I don't know if we can sample world populations. David will have to weigh in on that. But we want to uh, be able to use that, uh, use shotgun sequencing to begin to look for uh, inter interpopulation differences and and see what kind of uh, what kind of strain biogeography we might be able to identify in 
uh, Didymo populations, both in Lake Superior, in our rivers, and across North America, and maybe the world. <clears throat> um, what did we learn from the lake? Um, number one, we developed our, you know, the first time ever that we've been able to do at-depth sampling with, um, with uh, scuba divers. A great team uh, figured out a, a wor you know, workflow for them to go down. Uh, we found that there's plenty of paraphyton out there to you know, 16 meter depths. There's a, a video image of grab there. Interestingly, that's not as much didymo as you might think. That's probably no didymo out, out at that depth, but it's uh, other, other types of algae um, that are, 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 are common, especially uh, bulbopedi is, is common out there at depth. Um, what we found in, with regard to didymo is that it is limited in its distribution to the very nearest shore stations, typically half meter and two meter deep stations, suggesting that uh, light is also a real critical factor in controlling distribution of didymo, and especially in these, these near shore wave zones. Um, we've struggled with uh, the uh, assessment of, sp of spawning success. It's been uh, difficult to uh, collect eggs. We've tried a few other uh, strategies, um, both emergence traps in the spring, which uh, also were, were difficult, and we're moving to a, an actual, uh, this fall we're going to be using a vacuum um, a vacuum uh, sucker technique to, to collect uh, basically benthos and any eggs that are sitting between the, the, uh, the, the substrate. <clears throat> Well, what we did in 2022 or 2021 has been replicated, except we started a heck of a lot earlier in, in 2020, uh, in, in 2022, we got going in May with our five stream survey in July, we did our, our near shore blitz, uh, including we met, we got up to some of the Grand Portage tribal land streams in, last in September for the first time. Uh, nice to get a, get a, a re, uh, sense of what the, the far Northern reaches of our, of our uh, North shore streams were like. Um, as I mentioned, we backed off on one of the depth transects uh, in Lake Superior. Um, we tried larval fish traps and going to go with a, a vacuum technique. And then in October, actually next week, we are going to um, we're going to be uh, uh, David got a project funded to start looking at longitudinal surveys. So all of our sampling has been looking at single sites in the streams, and we want to actually go up and down the streams. We pick we picked four. The original ones were listed there on top. The bottom ones are probably the, the real targets. We're going to do the baptism cross devil track and cadence. And these include uh, really prime coaster brook trout, this threatened species that utilizes both the lake and the streams. And what we're going to be trying to do with this is not only look at the didymo and the effect it's having uh, at the lower ends of the, of the food web, but also moving up the food web, which including the invertebrate and the fisheries populations as well with those, that, that level of sampling. So we'll have electroshocking for fishes going on, as well as you know, benthic, benthos sampling for, for critters, um, trying to understand how places with and without didymo are affected from everything from nutrient flow to bacteria to algae up, up the entire food web. What we've learned so far in 2022 is that years differ from one another. Uh, so far, through September, we've found didymo in just five streams, uh, the Caribou, Onion, Devil, Track, and Kimball, which were all streams that we saw didymo in last year. And then we also found didymo in the Two Island, which was a, a new detect uh, for this year. Um, the Devil, Track, and Kimball have what we would consider bloom conditions. Very, very thick didymo mats have developed. Um, interestingly, we did not see those mats in July in the streams, but uh, really uh, saw them start picking up in the Kimball by August and both rivers by September. So we're f just for the first time getting a better sense of what the seasonality of this is. Um, we do have a few single detects in some of our streams. Um, again, it's not in the Poplar River again this year. Um, in Lake Superior, it seems to be somewhat less common than we saw in 2021. And one thing, we had a very, very different spring 2022. Um, Northern Minnesota had the one of the highest snowfall totals and hugest runoff events. We actually, when we went to sample in May, could hardly access any of the rivers. They were just roaring so bad. 
Um, but we very quickly again move to these dry base flow summer conditions, which right now are actually lower flow levels than we saw a year ago. And one thing it's, it's it's pointing at is it's highlighting that we're going to be seeing interannual differences in 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 Didymo. What we really hope to do is get a get a sense of what this what this impact is going to be on our North Shore streams. Uh, which streams are at risk? A better understanding of the ecology distribution and um, and fate of Didymo moving forward. Um, a good understanding of what happens to streams and lakes that as they develop Didymo, and hopefully come up with, you know, for instance, a habitat template that allows us to predict where and when Didymo may affect our North Shore streams. <clears throat> Um, I want to I want to wrap things up by talking just a little bit about education and outreach. Um, both uh, a bunch of us work for work for the Science Museum of Minnesota. So one of the things that's really important in, in our lives, and I think in a lot of scientific scientists lives is that we're thinking about what we can actually do with this information beyond, you know, just publishing, publishing in journals and sharing information with our colleagues. Instead, we want to be able to take this information to everyone. Some of the things that we've really been doing is um, working to you know, reach out with the press. We've had great opportunities to get radio interviews, uh, newspaper interviews, um, working with um, nonprofits to do blog posts, and also creating you know a, an accessible information sheet that we can uh, we can share with you know with anyone who's, who wants to know what's what's going on, what what this thing is, and and what what what's happening with it in our in our North Shore streams. Um, for that, it's been it's been it's, it's been important for us to I think also be forward about this and actually contacting the press and saying we got something going on here that you might be interested in, and that seems to be really an important way to you know, sort of stimulate that interest. And I, I'm getting the sense more and more that the press is interested in that that they'd love to hear from us rather than have to look for us. <clears throat> Other ways that we're we're working with them. Um, is, is through citizen science. Um, we've got two different programs that are being, I'll say monitored, I guess is the right way to do it, to try to um, and keep track of Didymo on the North Shore. One is iNaturalist, which I think most people have, have heard of, where it you know, allows uh, users to update an observation, and we're keeping track of, of uh, Didymo observations on the North Shore of, uh, of Lake Superior. A uh, second is a is a is a program called EdMaps, which is looking for, sort of specifically at aquatic invasive species, and we're coordinating that through the Minnesota DNR. Um, they actually are connected to iNaturalist, so they pull in observations from iNaturalist. But it's another place where uh, citizens who see you know see Didymo um, can recognize Didymo, can make those observations. Of course, the the other easy way is our our names are out, are one Google away. From uh, you know finding an email and, and sending us a note about about uh, the problems and we're we're getting you know we do get this commonly people reach out and say hey I heard I heard a talk I heard something about this um, we got this place on our stream looks nasty come can, any chance you guys can look at it and that's a, that's the kind of stuff we really want to have happen as well um, what are we going to do about it um, I think when we approached this project in the beginning it started out as um, we have a problem in the Poplar River that we better figure out what's going on before, you know, and didn't really think that a lot of the other streams were going to be a problem. And it was simply because we've been looking at those streams for decades and never seen Didymo in them. And I think after our first year, we've had to approach this from a different perspective that we need to think about a future that is going to include Didymo, not a future that doesn't have Didymo in it. And so, um, the DNR, uh, the Minnesota DNR, is of course, you know, one of the, the, the primary agencies that are working on, on doing this. And so we we're hoping that we can get Didymo recognized as um, as something that you know that resource users need to need to be aware of. Um, how can we do things like clean our boots and and not transport it between streams uh, throughout the North Shore and throughout the state? Um, we're doing some initial work to see if we can get um, felt-soled waders. Um, I don't want to say outlawed or 
just uh, hopefully not not as readily available in, in Minnesota. And I think in other places where this has been enacted, I think the retailers out there are 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 are, are happy to get on board because their businesses are actually um, dependent on healthy resources as well. So they'd, they'd be much more happy to protect those resources than put them at risk. Um, the Minnesota DNR has, uh, you know, lots of um, aquatic invasive messaging that goes out from you know, taking a pledge to protect water from invasive species to, uh, you know, not or cleaning your boats and, and gear between sites, and that these are the kind of things we hope to leverage in, in the messaging moving forward. Um, education is another aspect of uh, of what we're doing. Um, for this, you know, from from a, a broader education thing, we've had some. We've got, I mentioned early on, we've got postdocs and graduate students that are working on, working on this project, uh, as well as uh, we had a, a summer internship through the, the, through the DNR up there in the top picture is Danielle Kubal, who, in addition to being an awesome scientist, was, is also a, uh, a very creative artist. And she, uh, on her, one of her last days at work, put together these, um, these two coloring sheets that really provide some messaging about uh, what happens when Didymo gets into a stream and the effect it may have. Of course, education is not limited to, um, you know, college age folks or, or even coloring sheets. We can take that messaging anyway. So we're typically, we're, we're very welcome to just talk to people. And um, one of the funny, funnest things we've been doing is running into little kids who are sitting on the shore of Lake Superior and by gosh, they want to help. And we have them rinsing our bottles and doing all kinds of stuff and talking to their parents a little bit. Um, we're also going to, of course, bring this to the floor of the Science Museum, get our microscopes there and show them, uh, show everyone what, the, what, this is all, what this is all about. Finally, at the Science Museum of Minnesota, we have um, uh, STEM ed instructors who have you know, water quality and water uh, programming that is actually directed throughout all all of the state of Minnesota. And what we're going to be doing with them is actually modifying the, you know, their, their programming to include information on North Shore ecology. And again, the risks that we face of, you know, of aquatic invasive species, including, including Didymo. Finally, one thing that I think we overlook quite often in our, our outreach is, I call it institutional outreach. Um, Many of us work at universities or institutions where there's a lot of people that probably have no idea what a lot of other people are doing. And I think it's really important to find mechanisms to get that information you know, dispersed among, just within your own institution. A few weeks ago, we had a great opportunity to do that at, the, at, at our research station where we invite, we only got you know, 15 people that work at our research station, but there's, 400 people that work at the Science Museum of Minnesota. So we had a, uh, an all day open house where folks came out, shared rides came out and we did you know, multiple tours uh, just explaining about what the work we do, including Didymo and Roxnot. And our colleague uh, Heidi at the DNR, uh, they've got a great little uh, newsletter that they put out every year. And just this last year, they just said, hey, everyone just write what you're working on and share what you're doing. And, and, uh, and Heidi did a you know, nice write up talking about this uh, Didymo issue that uh, we've been working on in Lake Superior and the North Shore streams. So with that, I'll wrap things up. Um, plenty of thank yous to go on, I especially wanna thank our, our, funding, our funding agencies, the ENTRF, uh, Minnesota, C or Minnesota uh, DNR's uh, Lake Superior Coastal Program and Sea Grant. Um, we've had lots and lots of uh, help from various people, the dive team aboard the Blackfin, Rich and Tim, um, our, our group from uh, uh, this, the research station, Jeremy, Elena, Aaron, Heather, Amelia, all working hard on the water quality as well as crazy amounts of prep work for all of these things. Um, Chris P at the DNR was a uh, help develop those lobe samplers. Uh, Nick Peterson uh, is also in DNR fisheries and has an eye for Didymo, has actually picked up Didymo during a lot of his uh, his electrofishing surveys for us. Um, places along the North Shore have been very welcoming, whether it's uh, Lutzen Resort or Fensteads or Sugarloaf to let us sample on their, on their properties. At Graham Portage, uh, both 
National Monument and the, the tribal DNR has allowed us to work up on uh, Grand Portage lands. Uh, we can't do this without getting into some of the state parks uh, in, in the North Shore, so they've helped out. And then I've listed four writers there um, that we've been able to reach out to regularly to say, hey, we got something that might people might be interested in. Again, really encouraging people to be forward about reaching out to uh, people like that. And last, just the all the partners that we've uh, put together to, to tackle this project. Uh, with that, David, we can play question answer. I could, the one thing that I wanted to throw out there is, so we've, um, we've got an, an event, I've got an event coming up at the tail end of October at the at our science museum where we're going to be on the floor working with you know kids and stuff and one of the things that they've allowed us to they're going to allow us to do is make buttons for the kids and I'm looking for some catchy little phrases and I got my notebook here so I'll write them down catchy little phrases of how we can how we can program Didymo so so one like here's here's the one example I'll throw out there it's Didymo it's not funny Nothing? Okay. <laughs> I'd love to hear what other, uh, if anyone's got some other catchy little phrases that we can put on, you know, little pins that the kids can take home that, that's, that'll help, help uh, you know, provide that messaging. So anyway, thanks, folks. Hey, Mark, thank you very much. Round of applause for me, and I'm, I'm sure from everybody else, there's been a lot of great chat um, <clears throat> while you've been uh, talking. and. Um, I know I'm heavily invested in this project, and if I don't think about it every day, I'm definitely thinking about it every week. And it, I love to hear you explain it and, and help you know reframe it and reshape it in my mind. Um, I would like to say one thing about the effectiveness of outreach. Um, often when we are out uh, with the DNR, especially in the boat and have the divers, people often think we're doing some sort of search and rescue or some sort of uh, recovery. Uh, my, my daughter is attending now. Um, but uh, once we get past the fact that we're not um, doing any sort of regulation, um, Birdie, just a moment, please. Sorry about that, folks. Um, once we get past the fact that we're not doing any re regulation or search and rescue, we explain to people what we're doing. And at both boat landings in this last week of sampling, folks had uh, heard about the Didymo story uh, either on WTIP, which is one of the local radio stations, or in the Duluth newspaper. So um, once they got past the exciting stuff and they found out we we're just looking for the rock spot they're like oh i've heard about that so um it's it's nice to know that the message is is actually getting out um i'd like to just quickly direct to some uh discussion between uh vicky and anna um there's some discussion about whether or not diddy mo is in oklahoma and rather than relying on the website i say uh you ladies should go investigate and let us know and if you find some i would love for you to uh give me an address and also do a sampling kit and we can get some more um, Didymos populations in our genomic pool. All right. I, I know I saw I saw Liz Berge at the NADS meeting last week and mentioned it to her. She is the one who I, I know has reported it and worked on it. And, and she just said it was, it, it was I don't know, a couple hours away from where she's at in, in Norman. So she wasn't hadn't been out looking for it at all recently. So. Um. Here's, here's maybe an easy question for you, Mark. Uh, Gina wants to know if you have a link for the coloring sheets or where can people access the coloring sheets? <laughs> it's, it's funny, those coloring sheets uh, were officially approved for use last Tuesday and we haven't got them up on a website yet. Um, we, will, we will do that um, um, eventually. If you, if you just, you can, you can send, send me a, a, a quick note and I will send them to you if you if you want uh right there's my email and the thing there um you can we can we can uh yeah I'm happy to send them to you so well cool. and we have a couple questions in the chat but we have some hands up some virtual hands and I don't want them to get tired so we'll we'll go to Julie <clears throat> who's at the top of the list thanks you guys that was a great mark um, I've kind of been on the periphery of this through Michigan. Um, I had a question. So are you in the populations that you guys have been looking at, are you seeing a pretty linear correlation between cell density and mucilage production or do these populations vary in per cell, you know, 
I, I, I don't know whether it's a linear relationship, but I would say at least from a, you know, from a, you know, from, from a, the more, more of the, more of the, you know, looking through the microscope and being in the field doing the sampling, I would say that yes, when we do get lots of, of mucilage production in, especially in the streams, it is linked to didymo. Um, I wouldn't say that as much in the lake itself. We're seeing a number, of, a number of other species in the lake that are quite capable of putting together some, a lot, quite a bit of mucilage, in particular some of the larger symboloids. symboloids. And I know that's been um, similarly noted in other uh, places where didymo has, uh, has shown up, that some of the symbella mexicana, symbella yanishii are also um, adding to that mucilage burden. But right now it seems like, um, at least in the North Shore stream sites, that it when we do get that mucilage, it is didymo that mm -hmm. is showing up. And they don't seem to be responding, the didymo itself doesn't seem to be responding differently as far as how much mucilage they produce based on these, you know, based on the different streams or anything like that you've you noticed. There's no difference in per cell production. Or <clears throat> I, I've not been able to, you know, I, I, I haven't been able to, I would say right now, we're, we're still waiting on those results to, you know, take a look at the, you know, like what we've got for the ash, ash free dry mass versus our abundance levels on, on those types of things. Yeah. So, um, it, yeah, I, at least in the, in the, there does seem to be some differences among like, like the Kimball and Devil Track look the the mucil the diet the the didymo mats look identical. They they also are only a few, you know, a kilometer, a couple of kilometers apart from each other. Those two watersheds. Um, but it I would say that in some of the other streams, and I showed that one picture of sort of the uh, what didymo looks like in our streams, that we do see some differences of what, what the what that mat looks like. That's a good point and something I think that we re we really should explore as to as to how that is. And I don't know if it's related to the other contributors to that mat, what other algae right. and diatoms are living in that mat, or or not? But that that's a good that's a good uh, a good direction to think about in this case. Thanks. Sure. And uh, David, I do we can talk offline, but I do have some samples for you from the Borman in Manistee. They're, they're cryo frozen right now. Oh. Um, we could actually extract DNA for you before we send them. It's up to you. Um, but we do. We do have the ability to do that, just so whatever you like. Yeah, let's let's chat about that. If you can save me the work, hey, no, no, I appreciate that though. Um, yeah, we'll we'll uh, talk about getting them here. Um, I just wanted to throw out one other uh, observation that we've kind of made um, in just the initial examination of these populations, and um, and that is the stream populations tend to have the um, the the, the co-assemblage of, of monoray fids that we often observe with Didymo, but interestingly in the Lake Superior samples, um, the, the, the epiphytic diatoms on the, on the stalks are often um, needle-like uh, A-ray fids, uh, fragilaria zonarias. And mm -hmm. so that would be an interesting um, uh, observation to follow up on and, and check to see how things shaked out in like Lake Hoskal Didymo populations and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Thanks, Julie. Um, Thank you. Leela? Leela, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I wanted to know uh, for fishery study, uh, is uh, the, um, the Didymo uh, like uh, the Pseudonychia uh, has the same um, uh, toxic molecule um, uh, to harm a fish. Uh, we have pseudonychia in hot uh, and uh, uh, high content uh, mineral uh, as the Mediterranean, for example. And for you, uh, uh, for, um, uh, I mean, um, uh, molecular study, do, do you have the same uh, toxic molecule? Yeah, I, um, I would say fortunately for us, um, the didymo has not shown up to be toxic. Um, ah, okay. which is which, yeah so it's not like some of the you know the demoic acid producers in the in the marine setting which is which is really good i think uh, at least uh, it, it hopefully will 
not make it as bad of an as a as a as an ecological invader or ecological changer as the case might be. But it, as far as I'm aware, there's no to no toxicity associated with them um, with that species. Be because you said that uh, uh, it has influence on uh, fish, uh, bacteria, mm -hmm. algae. Uh, so which kind exactly of influence? Is it just uh, take a lot of mud? Yeah, it, I, in, ter in terms of the, the impact, and again, we have, well, what's interesting is we only know this from work that's been done on other sites. It's such a new problem in our North Shore streams that we're just beginning to, next week, we're going to begin to take take a look at, at what the uh, potential impact. We know that it changes um, distribution of fishes in a stream, um, in terms of size distribution of streams. And of course, we know that it uh, really dramatically impacts the invertebrate um, populations in streams, which are, you know, the, fi the fish food themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, Boogery Basilariophyta, I like that. You got thank that. You, Kyle. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say we have say no to Didymo and rocks not the Boogery Basilariophyta. So we can <laughs> those down. And um, just real quickly to follow up on the toxicity, um, some areas that we are interested in and um, if anybody has any expertise we're definitely open to to talking about that um, um, but there is some research on the polyphenol releases from the stocks that are um, lethal to salmon eggs and also to daphnia populations and that's uh, hopefully some future areas of research we're going to pursue and, and also keep following um, on the literature um, sarah Thanks, David. And thank you, Mark. Um, I think there's no doubt that Didymo and particularly rock snot has done a huge amount for making diatoms known to so many of the general public that that's has been a lot of the way in. Um, but I'm going to push back a little bit because I'm not sure that um, this diatom is not healthy. And um, I hope you'll if you'll indulge me a little bit. I'll give I'll give my sort of uh, twenty years of chasing Didymo around um, of what um, what seems like um, is happening in different places, and um, so we know it's a good colonizer, even on its own. And that's evidence by um, a couple of years ago, um, published a uh, paleo study going back to glacial record. And it came there without humans being around, right? 14,000 years ago. So we know it's good on its own. Um, we know that it's transported by humans as evidenced by the New, New Zealand experience, that that really shows people can bring it around. Um, we know it's favored by dams. You mentioned that um, tailwaters and base flow conditions. And um, that's evidenced um, in looking at um, modeling it across North America in presence absent models by Kumar et al. Um, we also know that controls on the present on local distribution, so like what's happening in an individual stream is different than the, and that's evidenced by Cullis et al, is different from the, the controls on regional distributions. Um, so I wanted to just make sure that that point is, that that, that can be um, conflated between what's a what's a local control and what's more of a flow, flow control. Um, in Kumar et al, we found that it was low flow really favoring Didymo. And one of the things I'd just like to suggest that really hasn't been looked into um, is that um, light and this drought precipitation relationship and particularly dissolved organic carbon because that also um, blocks light and um, can really knock out Didymo, particularly we see that in Colorado in the spring when there's a flush of DOC, it, it gets wiped out. 
Um, and yeah, so I've, I am actually not aware of any studies that show that it has a negative impact on fish yet. So if you have those, I'd be really interested to see that. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I think that the main information that came out was out of Rapid City in South Dakota. Um, and I, I, I don't have the citation off the top of my head on that. Um, yeah, I, I think that that was not um, substantiated, that that was really related to Didymo in Rapid Creek. Okay. That okay. there were some other things going on. Um, and I, you know, I know a lot of people have looked um, at, you know, size, class, age classes, size, you know, it certainly changes the size class of invertebrates. So you'd expect it would have that effect on fish. Mm -hmm. oh, I see Dan has his hand up, so he, maybe he can speak to that. Yeah, hello, Dan. Good to see you. Want to weigh in? <laughs> Good to see you guys, too. Good to see you, Mark, Sarah, David. Hey, um, hi, Dan. Thanks for the talk, Mark. Um, uh, yeah, I, I was uh, going to ask a question, but I'd have to agree a lot with what uh, Sarah just said. Uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of Diddy Mo up here. And um, I've I've looked at uh, I also look at coronamids, and I've I've seen you know in places where we've collected bugs out of uh, Didymo mats, some coronamids high grade those Didymo valves, and their guts just stuffed with them. Um, um, anyway, um, my my question was uh, as if is um, I was curious if you've looked at any sediment cores in the lake to get uh, an idea of what uh, historic um, occurrences or, or distributions may have been like? Yeah, good question. It's, it's a nice, actually a nice tie-in with what, what Sarah was mentioning. Um, so the sh let's see, the short answer is um, we took a, 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 along the north shore of Minnesota, we don't have good near shore depositional basins. Um, we've tried, we've looked, we've hunted. Um, we have to go quite a ways offshore to start getting good conformable sedimentation. Um, we did take a core back in the 2000s from uh, an embayment on Isle Royal, which is a, the large island in Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. And I prepped up, we dated the core, did all that stuff. I prepped up samples and I could not find a didymo in it. And I know, I mean, I, I scanned, you know, entire cover slips trying to find one. Um, it was a, uh, it, it, there is Didymo sometimes on the, in the near shore paraffin of Lake Superior in, in Lake Superior. Um, uh, so it, I, I sort of thought maybe we'd find it there, but we, at this stage, we do seem limited to Stormer's collection on his honeymoon as sort of the, mm -hmm. the starting point in, in, um, Superior. I, I do want to get to uh, the Philadelphia Academy at some point in time and really get a better take a better look whether there's other Great Lakes collections that are out there. The two reports from um, Lake Michigan, which are sort of pre you know pre impact of what happened to Lake Michigan, um, I don't have any any reason to disbelieve them or doubt them. Um, they you know it's a it's a pretty pretty identifiable diatom. One of the things that I think is um, I think what both the comments you've made, Dan, and the comment that Sarah's made is whether or not, I know that this diatom is really big and unless you're kind of looking for it, sometimes it doesn't jump out of your sample or if you do see it, you think maybe it's just a goofy contaminant that got in there. But um, we are, I did mention as I was in my talk that we, we sometimes are seeing these sort of one, one specimen stuff like, oh, what's that doing in there? And you. I think in the past we always blew that off, but it makes me wonder if whether Didymo has lived in these North Shore streams for a long time, and it's just something changing now that's really causing it to um, do this. Um, we don't have, you know, a long history of good, great collections from our North Shore streams of paraphyte that have been made. I, I need to search out some of those. I'm sure a few of them have been sampled for, you know, some of the Nakwa projects or something like like that. Uh, in the past, 
but um, it would be great to you know get a chance to really do some do some hunting for hunting for this stuff. Um, but uh, Dan, I, I, your question about you 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 commented that um, you were seeing coronamids that were stuffed with them. Um, uh, just off the top of your head, uh, genus of coronamids by chance? Um, mostly orthoclads. Orthoclads, um, okay. So a lot of a lot of the, that uh, Cricotopus orthocladius. Uh, okay. I know I, I've seen them in those guys quite a bit. Okay, that's that's interesting. We're we're planning to do some um, looking at gut analysis. We've done it on some other other um, invert groups, both uh, with some chronomids and also um, uh, uh, gamerids in in the Great Lakes, looking at what they've eaten in their guts and really kind of curious whether, how this didymo is being utilized as a resource actually. And I, I mean, your, your comment about, um, you know, I love high grading. I don't, I don't hear that term enough in my life. You know. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's, a, that's probably, a, a, I'm curious if we're seeing any of that and whether it's something that is, a, you know, that, that you know, didymo is here and it's now gonna be utilized or not. So. Yeah, I, I, I say that because not all of the, the chronomids like that I get from a site would have Didymo in their gut from the same genus, you know, yep. same chronomid. Some of them were definitely eating nothing but Didymo and others not so much. So um, anyway, I've got, <laughs> as you know, I've got lots of Didymo up here. If you want any Alaskan Didymo, just... Uh, David, go ahead and send me that sampling kit and I'll, I'll grab some. But you, you say also, Mark, um, that you, you wonder if um, uh, it's su in such low quantities that you might not even be picking it up on your counts and you might scan an entire cover slip and not even see one. Um, and I would, that's quite possible. I mean, I almost always get it in super low quantities and some most times it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, come up in the 600 valve count, mm -hmm. um, but if you look around on the cover slip, it's it's quite often there. So sure, sure. Yeah, Dan, I'll I'll get in touch with you. We have somebody who is hopefully sampling around in the Kenai, and I mean, we welcome more more samples from there. Or if you know of other populations, I'm for sure as much geographic diversity as possible. So yeah, I'll reach out. Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got a. Uh, a reach of uh, Chester Creek or Campbell Creek that's uh, about two miles away from me right now. <laughs> that sets up pretty good if we get low flow conditions. So, nice end of June probably. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everybody. Another round of applause for um, Mark for getting here towards the top of the hour. I just wanted to uh, point out I've been taking a bunch of screenshots, but Sarah is. Uh, dumping a lot of Didymo citations into the chat if you want to follow up. Um, um, that would be great. Maybe we can even put these uh, uh, citations on the on the, the Dona Didymo talk page for today. Um, I don't want to make extra work for anybody. Um, I did want to circle back to one thing I believe Anna said, and I'm scrolling through the text. I'm just going to think that Anna said it or Vicky said it. But um, that uh, the iNaturalist reportings of Didymo may be more reflective of where diatomists are rather than where Didymo is. So maybe something fun to keep in mind. But um, anyways, as always, uh, uh, thank everybody. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email Joe Mohan or Mark Edlin or myself. Um, we'd love to chat with you all about it more. Um, the talk will be uploaded to YouTube. And again, we'll be meeting again in two weeks um, where Blanco will discuss with us uh, the diatom flora, um, her development of the diatom flora and um, uh, the South Platte River. So thank you all. It was great to see everyone. Um, thanks for attending and, and kicking off this season of the Diatom Web Academy um, so strongly. Um, everybody uh, have a great day and, and happy diatomizing. <laughs>
gathering of Didymo folks in, what is it, Rhode